you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it, but you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Our guest for this week's show is head of the real estate group at Republic, Janine Yorio. Now, Republic is a leading alternative investment platform open to all investors and has closed over $150 million in investments in 200 plus companies throughout 100 countries. Republic is backed by both strategic capital partners and traditional traditional venture capital firms, including Binance and Passport Capital. Founded in 2016, Republic is based in New York City and has 50 employees. So guys, I'm excited to introduce Janine here to the show. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items to run through. Uh, first and foremost, just want to make an announcement. You probably heard over the last couple of weeks that we just launched our third mobile home park investment fund. Uh, just went live uh, again a couple of weeks ago. And um, we've got a healthy pipeline of, of off-market deals cooking. So lots of exciting things happening behind the scenes here at Sunrise Capital Invest. If you guys want to learn more about partnering with uh, our team, you know, which has a proven track record, we've been doing mobile home parks for nearly a decade now, and we've got the case studies to back it up. Uh, if you have an interest, you can go over to investwithsunrise.com. Again, investwithsunrise.com. And there you can watch our most recent webinar and gain access to our PPM and offering docs. And if you guys aren't familiar with the mobile home park, a space or just mobile home park investments in general, do yourself a favor and watch that webinar. And I think what you'll quickly realize is that um, there's a reason why some of the biggest private equity groups, such as Blackstone, Carlisle Group, and, and Apollo, just to name a few, are heavily betting on the mobile home park sector. Again, go to investwithsunrise.com to get access to that information. Uh, moving on here, if you guys love what we're doing here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, please take a moment and subscribe to the show. That way you get notified when new episodes go live. And also, please leave a review and rating. And that's how we attract awesome guests such as Janine to the show. Um, lastly, here before we get on with it, I want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call I offer each and every Friday. This is where I set aside two or three 30-minute time slots. Been doing it now for over six years. Uh, or I can jump on the horn with you. You and I can connect and talk about anything and everything related to real estate investing. And really doesn't matter if you're brand new or a seasoned pro, uh, we'll love to meet you. And again, it's, it's fun sharing kind of the passion for real estate investing. So I've talked to hundreds of you over the years and we'll love to meet you. So if you want to schedule that call, go to kevinbupp.com to get signed up. Now, guys, I'd like to welcome our guest here for today's show, Janine Iorio. Janine, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Kevin? I am doing awesome. And as we were talking about before we started recording, you are based where? In the heart of it, right? I am based in New York City. All righty. But what Janine and I were talking about is, uh, you know, the, the media, all the spins that they, they put on things. And uh, I was asking her how things are going. And just to, to give you guys some context here, we're recording this on November 17th. And, and uh, her feedback was New York is lively. She's out, she was out and about and, uh, you know, restaurants are busy. They're humming, lots of energy. And so that, that was very promising to hear. As we know, if we only you know, gain our, our, our news from, you know, CNN and Fox News that we all get steered in very probably wrong directions. And so I'm glad to hear that, Janine. I'm glad to hear that you, you and your family are doing well. And uh, things are hopefully getting back to not normal yet, but at least a little bit more normal than probably what they've been for the last seven or eight months. Um, with that being said, Janine, what I'd like to do here in the beginning of the show is give you a chance, pass the mic back to you, give you a chance to uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, maybe your, your background prior to Republic, and then we'll dive into Republic and what it is you guys offer. Sounds good. So I've been working in real estate and, uh, investment since I graduated from college, which was a while ago. I started my career on Wall Street, and then I went to work for a real estate private equity firm called North Star Capital, where I, was a, I started as an analyst, and I was there for about nine years, and I worked my way up to portfolio manager. North Star managed billions of dollars in institutional real estate state capital. And I managed at various different points in time, two different funds for them. One was a $100 million structured debt fund. And um, then I worked on a JV equity fund as well. So I've spent my career underwriting all different kinds of assets. Um, I have a lot of experience in the hotel space because I was also the head of real estate development at Standard Hotels in New York. But for the last five or so years, I've been working in real estate related tech startups. And I started my own company, 
about two and a half years ago called Compound. And Compound had built an app that allowed uh, regular investors to invest in real estate in big cities. In June of this year, a company called Republic acquired my company and my team and I joined Republic. And now we all are working at Republic to build out a platform under the Republic umbrella that's designed to make it easier for investors, individual investors to invest in real estate. Got it. I appreciate that. And um, getting you know, to Republic, what was the you know the, the the missing ingredient? Well, I guess maybe tell us a little bit more about Republic and the the different you know services or what that platform mm-hmm. offers investors. And then what was the missing ingredient as to why Republic uh, uh, you know acquired Compound? Sure. So Republic was started as an offshoot to AngelList, and AngelList is the startup investment platform um, that's been around for a while. They're focused primarily on accredited investors. So Republic had a different angle. They came out of the Jobs Act of 2016, um, and they created a platform that made it easier for non-accredited investors to invest in startups. They built that platform for the last several years, and over that time, they acquired a huge customer base. So they have over 800,000 users on the platform on Republic that are looking for investment opportunities at any given time. They built up a at like a track record in startup investing, and then they acquired a video game and esports investment platform. They also built out a crypto and digital asset investment platform. They built out a private wealth platform that helps uh, higher net worth investors invest in late stage companies like pre-IPO uh, tech companies. And they kept hearing from their customers that they wanted to see that their customers wanted to see real estate investing on the platform. So it was a very logical combination for them because we brought to the table the real estate expertise, and they brought an active and engaged user base and all of the technology and compliance infrastructure that we needed in order to scale our business. So it's been a really symbiotic marriage so far. We've done a lot of really cool things and have had a lot of really cool things in the pipeline too. Got it. Do you find that your user base, uh, there's a lot of cross pollination between the different niches or sectors that you guys serve? You know, you, you have tech startups, you got real estate now, you have video games, crypto. Is there a lot of crossover? Yeah, it's it's an alternative investment platform for retail investors. And the way I like to explain Republic is that it's like Goldman Sachs for private investing. So we do lots of different things to help issuers access individual investments. So lots of startups, lots of companies, real estate deals, even crypto companies have investors that are you know, hundreds of people all around the world. What Republic does is automate something like that so that it can be easier for more companies to access capital, even when that capital is coming from all around the world in relatively small dollar amounts, because that's complicated. It's labor intensive, and it can be very costly if you haven't optimized the process, which is what Republic has done. So yes, when we launch a real estate offering, oftentimes the investors are some of the same people who've invested in startups or crypto. This is, this is a platform where people are looking to fill their bucket with alternative investments and different people want to see different things. They don't come to Republic looking to invest in public equities and stocks, but they do come to Republic because they're looking for unique investment opportunities that are uncorrelated, some of which have really high potential risk rewards that would be very difficult to find in, in a public market type platform. Got it. Let's talk about the real estate platform. Again, started out as Compound Acquired, I believe you said in June of this mm-hmm. year, uh, yes. which is now known as the Republic uh, Real Estate Crowdfunding Platform. Um, what separates this platform from the, you know, the, the multiple other real estate crowdfunding platforms that exist today? So first of all, I don't really love the word crowdfunding. I think crowdfunding is very specific and talks about only one part of what we do at Republic. Mm-hmm. So Retail investors can invest through regulation crowdfunding, which is an SEC exemption that's very specific. Republic does a lot more than that. There are other exemptions through which issuers can raise retail capital. There's Reg A, there's Reg D, which is what most private real estate funds have been using for a long time. So there are lots of different tools that an issuer can use. And Republic can help any issuer use any of those tools. It just so happens that crowdfunding is the one that I think had captured the popular imagination the most, but it's not even the biggest um, the biggest revenue source or, or biggest um, pipeline at Republic. We do a lot of our offerings off-platform they, they may not even show up on our website if you're not an accredited investor. So we have a very robust Reg D investment pipeline and um, group that's placing those kinds of deals in addition to the Reg CF deals that you will see on our platform on the website. 
Got it. First and foremost, I appreciate you correcting me on the crowdfunding thing. I feel like that 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 terminology gets thrown on way too much and way too loosely. So you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you put me in my place. No, no. I think no, it's, it's good. I understand the evolution of the space because I think several of the platforms are sort of moving up the food chain and it's interesting to see which direction they're headed in. But Republic has very squarely set out to become really something more um, industry agnostic and focused on facilitating retail capital investment and alternative investments through any of the mechanisms that available that are available that are legal and compliant. Mm-hmm. How about the, the different types of real estate offerings? I spent you know, just a few minutes on the site yep. looking at the existing offerings. It looks like the majority, if, if not you know, all of them, at least that are present today, are uh, more aligned with residential investments, maybe a, a high rise con, a condo in a high rise tower, a single family home, maybe a short term rental type arrangement. Uh, is that, for the most part, the type of offerings uh, that R- Republic supports, or do you also have commercial real estate as well? We would we would work with issuers of any kind. Historically, we'd focused on urban residential real estate just because that was something that nobody else was doing. Mm-hmm. But but that was at Compound. Now that we're part of Republic, our mandate is much broader, and we will glad work with issuers that are looking to raise capital for commercial projects for you know literally anything that falls into a real estate category so we've seen really interesting things from companies that sell billboard space um, solar panels you know there are lots of different kinds of real estate that we would be excited to offer to our investors but again not all of them will appear on the Republic homepage because not all of them are regulation CF offerings so we do have offerings live even today that are not on that website that are commercial real estate and they are, um, you know, in different categories than residential. They're just not open to all investors, so they don't appear on the main website. Got it. And let's talk about the other side of things from the sponsor's perspective. Um, you know, what is it like to be a sponsor and work with Republic? You know, what are some of the, the benefits? Um, how does Republic vet sponsors? What have you? So I think there are two really compelling reasons to work with Republic. First of all, there are certain categories in the real estate space where it's really helpful to have a marketing edge and to have some sort of virality to your project where you have evangelists that are out there telling people, getting them excited to use your project, whether it's a hotel or, for example, one of the projects we have on our site today is a condo project in a vacation market. So there are reasons why it'd be helpful to have hundreds, thousands of investors, all of whom are basically marketing for you every time they post on their social media, hey, I just invested in this project. And to amplify that connection, Republic has actually built an internal platform for issuers that we call social capital. And that allows investor, I'm sorry, issuers to get to know who their investors are, to reach out to them. And it also allows the investors in the project to say to the issuers, hey, I'm so-and-so and and I know this specific thing that I think is going to be helpful to you in your project and I would like to help. And so you immediately bring onto your team a hundred or a thousand investor owners who are rooting for your success, many of whom are very connected or have capabilities or skills that could be very complementary to your project. And that's something very unique about raising capital from the community. You get all these people out there all around the world who are rooting for your project's success and better yet, talking about it. And the second second thing that's really compelling is if you're a, a fund manager who hasn't yet built an institutional track record, but you're still really doing great things, this is a way for you to build a unique competitive advantage by having your own roster of investors that you can raise capital from repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And while it sounds onerous, if you were to do it yourself and try to raise money from a hundred or 500 people every time you want to do a deal or kick off a fund, yeah, that would, that would be terrible. But the beauty of doing it with Republic is once you turn it on, it's all automated. You're not talking to investors. You're not meeting them by Zoom or in person. And once you've built up a reputation with that base of investors, they tend to invest repeatedly in your projects. So it's a great way for an emerging manager to start building a track record and a name for themselves on a platform that has been recognized as compliant and trustworthy and with some longevity in the space. When a retail investor is searching the platform and looking at the various investments that are posted, can they can they gain some additional insight on the sponsor themselves? Uh, does it have details on that sponsor, their track record, yep. Um, yep. case yep. studies, what have you? Yeah, each of the web pages that we create for the offering is um, it's it's basically based on information that's filed with the SEC. So there is a there's a trustworthiness to that information, but we often provide lots of information about the background of the sponsor. 
Got it. And then on the investor side, I mean, would one experience the same type of benefits uh, of, of owning the real estate? I mean, the, the, the depreciation flows through, there's distributions that are had either on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on the project itself. I mean, is, they get the upside in the equity. Is it the normal arrangement that an LP might find themselves in? It's, it's honestly varies deal by deal. So okay. what the public does is offer the technology to automate the capital raising process, yeah. but the terms are set by the sponsor. Mm-hmm. So we don't tell the sponsor, oh, you have to give people, you know, you can only take a 2% management fee and you can only take 10% of the carry. You come to us, we vet your deal. We decide if we think those terms are market, but ultimately it's up to you, the sponsor to dictate what the terms are. Um, but obviously we're looking out on behalf of our investors and, and aim to make sure that deals have market rate terms and that they're equitable to investors. But yes, the intent is for each individual offering to be like any other a real estate offering where you're either investing in a fund or a project at market standard terms and you you get treated like all of the other equity in that project uh, pro rata or pari passu depending upon the deal and you see the same economics that you would if you invested in an in offline in a country club deal or through your broker or through any other way that you ordinarily invest in real estate. Sure. And I understand it's case by case, but what is the, I guess, I guess just on the platform itself and the real estate side of things, what is the, the typical investment size or minimum investment uh, that, that you see in a lot of these different offerings? I mean, are we talking hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars? Um, again, it totally depends. We had right. an offering on our platform where the minimum was $49. We also, have hmm. a, we also have an offering on our platform today that's open only to accredited where the investment minimum is $50,000. So it really does vary tremendously and it is set by the issuer and it depends on which kinds of investors they want. In the case of that $49 minimum, there was a really strong social impact component where the developer wanted to be sure to to allow members of the community where the project was being built to invest in the project. And so he intentionally set the minimum so low that literally anybody could do it. Mm-hmm. When we raise money for a more traditional fund, they don't want to have thousands of investors. They don't want to have people writing $250 checks. They want to know that their investors are serious and ultimately they don't want to deal with that many small, inexperienced investors. So it really is up to the issuer to tell us what they're looking for. And then we figure out the best way to make that happen through our platform. How long does it typically take being a sponsor to get uh, approved, you know, vetted and approved and, and up on the platform, getting offering up on the Republic platform? What's the timeline normally look like? The the pace is usually driven by the issuer. It depends on how organized they are. If they have everything already and they've been very meticulous with their accounting, we can have a listing live in about 30 days. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, it's, it's probably on the order of 45 to 60 days just because the issuers themselves may not be quite as organized as we would have hoped, but they set the pace. And truthfully, something could be live in 10 days, but they would have to have everything ready to go. Got it. Talking about COVID-19, you know, we've been in this now for eight months. I guess you can really look at the start and at least how it's been affecting the U.S. going back to March. Um, have you guys noticed any trends or patterns as far as a, a lot more capital raising activity or less capital raising activity? And I know, I know the acquisition you know, compound to Republic happened in the yeah. middle of all this, but I mean, just generally speaking, uh, has there been an uptick or a downtick uh, overall? So we've seen an overall increase in investment volume since the pandemic. In fact, we've had some of Republic as a platform has had has had some of the best months they've ever had since the pandemic hit, which is wow. really interesting and very counterintuitive. What has worked is also kind of intuitive. For example, we did have a hotel offering on the real estate platform that did not perform very well. Um, people are looking for things they understand. They're looking for safe categories. Residential real estate is doing really well, as, you, as you've probably heard in, in the media. You know, people are buying homes at record rates and they're buying second homes. And so the residential category is performing really well. And retail investors tend to invest into the wind. They they invest with momentum. And so those categories have performed better than some of the more counter cyclical or contrarian plays that I think the institutional investors have more of the stomach for. Mm-hmm. I know you'd mentioned a, a stint that you did at Standard Hotels. Um, yeah. Obviously, so you're very familiar with the hospitality industry. It's the it's yeah. the industry that's getting the, the, the deepest and greatest impact as a result of COVID. What are your your general thoughts on um, you know uh, that industry as a whole? You know, does it pull itself back out? If so, you know, time frame. We talking 12, 24, 36 months. I mean, there's a lot of pain out there being felt. But what are your your general opinions on that industry? So I think there are two asset classes that are getting hammered right now: retail, yeah, 
and hotels. So I think the difference between the two is that retail, I don't see a bright light in the near future. I do think humans are ingenious and they will figure out really creative ways to to use all of that excess space, but nobody's cracked that code yet. Mm -hmm. Hotel, on the other hand, as soon as COVID is not a threat anymore, whether there's a vaccine or we have herd immunity or people just stop being afraid of it. I think we're going to go into a period of time that is going to look like the roaring twenties and everybody of every age is going to party their tail off. They're going to start booking (laughs) vacations and they're going to go nuts because they've all been locked down for way too long, myself included. And I think the hotel and resort space is going to come back guns a blazing. So I have no doubt that hotels will come back. And yes, there's, there's going to be a lot of pain between now and then, but the thing with real estate investors, the good ones is they invest for the long term. This is not stock market investing. You can't take its temperature every every month and you shouldn't mark to market that frequently. When you invest in real estate, you have to take a real estate time horizon, which is, you know, 5 to 10 years. And even the the bigger the bigger funds, the wealthier families, they think about real estate in 20 to 50 year intervals. Like if you look back in history at some of the darkest days in real estate investing, the big real estate families doubled down when places were on their knees. So for example, Rockefeller Center was built during during the Great Depression, when literally nobody else was building anything. The Rockefeller family had the foresight to realize, okay, the city's going to come back. This location camp is a camp miss, and they double down. So that's not for everybody. Most people don't have the stomach. Most people don't have the foresight. Most people don't end up that rich. But to the people who have the ability to look into the future and see that this too shall pass, that humans are, they have amnesia. They forget about bad things and they move forward. And history is almost always an upward trending line. Mm -hmm. So those people will have the ability to invest in some of the deepest dips we will have seen in our lifetime. And my, my prediction is those people are going to make out like bandits. So I think the retail investors who can start to think like that, put on their long-term caps, look for distress in areas that are going to come back. It's just that nobody knows exactly when. I think there's a tremendous amount of wealth to be created right now. I haven't been following any of the hospitality uh, sales. I, I will say that I've seen a massive uptick over the past three or four months on Crexy, just list, listings coming over with probably 70% of them being uh, hotel listings or hotel yeah. auctions, probably more attributed to you know CMBS defaults, what have you. Um, what are your thoughts as far as, I, I mean, are there, have you seen, I know that you're, you're tied you know, pretty deeply, deeply rooted into just the real estate industry in general. Have you heard of other discounts being had? I mean, uh, or not yet too soon? Well, there haven't been as many transactions as people were expecting. And I think that's true across a lot of categories. You know, I think mm-hmm. New York City condo is another another asset class that's been hammered. But it's, it's not like... Um, the difference, I think, between this situation and in past corrections is that we all know the other shoe is likely to drop, but it hasn't yet. You know, and everybody's waiting for there to be a bloodbath in hotels because they know that loans are being defaulted on. But the difference is that every hotel owner is defaulting. It's not like there's a couple of really terrible hotels that are underperforming. It's the entire sector has been decimated. The lenders don't want to foreclose. So I don't think that there have been as many sales as people were expecting to see. So assets haven't really repriced yet. I think a lot of people are gathering dry powder and waiting on the sidelines for the moment when the transactions actually start happening at bargain basement prices. But the truth is it hasn't really started yet. Yeah, I, I I very much agree on your perspective on retail and, and hospitality. The one, the one elephant that I don't think we've talked about is office, right? And that that's kind of the, um, I guess you could go either way, right? If if we get a vaccine and 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 people start feeling safe again, I think a lot of companies have found that maybe they're just as productive, if not more productive, by being remote. But I think equal amounts of companies have have found that they've they've lost some efficiency. Uh, by not actually having a collective office setting where their staff can come in. And so, uh, you know, I think the unknown with offices, will people go back to working in an office? You know, will only a portion go back? Will we have an excess amount of of office inventory? And, you know, most of these leases are three, five, 10 year leases, long-term leases. So it will, in my opinion, it will be kind of a delayed, uh, a delayed pain that is felt if and when it's felt. I mean, what do you think? I think that working from home sucks. I, I, think it's, I think it's depressing. I think it's terrible for morale. It's horrible for collaboration. Um, I've watched the younger members on my team, I think, really struggle with 
you know, some, I wouldn't call it mental health because that implies the seriousness is probably not there, but work, going to work in an office. Okay. It's not all, you know, foosball and high fives, but it's, it's oftentimes a lot of fun, right? Those casual conversations you have with your coworkers going out for lunch. What are you wearing? What'd you do this weekend? That's over. It doesn't happen by Zoom. And yes, people might be finding more time because they're not commuting, but it's not like people are, you know, writing the great American novel during that time. They're just watching more Netflix and drinking more. So I think once the world returns back to normal, we're going to be so happy to see our coworkers and to do things in real time. I think office space may end up looking differently, but I don't think there's going to be a sudden movement where all of a sudden everybody wants to work from home. There are a lot of people out there that chose to work in offices because they like to be around humans. Even the introverts, I think, are finding they need human interaction more than they ever really thought. Mm -hmm. And this whole shutdown is, in some ways, highlighting how important that is to mental health and morale. So I think long-term offices is, is probably fine. There is probably an overbuild situation in the near term. You know, I think corporate credits remain pretty strong. So it's it's not like there's an underlying issue where the corporations that have signed the leases themselves are, are having trouble and they're needing to cut costs. So I, I don't know if it's going to be as bad as we think it will be. Um, I think near term, there's going to be some pain. But again, I go back to my original point, which is don't think about this in one to two years. If you look out at 2030, where do you think office space is going to be? Do you think everybody's going to be holed up in their guest room wearing pajamas on their bottom half 10 years from now? <laughs> Nobody ever took over the world that way. So, and there's a reason. So it's just kind of like school, you know, six months ago, everybody's saying, oh, this is going to be the end of school and school's going to be fully remote. Well, anybody that has a child will tell you right now, there is not a chance in hell that full school is going to be fully remote ever. It doesn't work. And I think we're going to start really seeing how it doesn't work for most people all the time in office. Maybe we move to a more flexible model where people are working from home one to two days a week. But this idea that companies will be fully distributed, I think that's going to still be a very fringe thing. You know, I think that's a that's a really good comparison that that I, I've never really thought of. Uh, we, children with virtual learning. So our kids down here in you know Florida, at least in the county that we're in, they went back. Um, they went back a few months ago, and so they've been full, full you know five days a week in school, and it's been amazing, right? Like they uh-huh. basically, it's like time. Ha- you know, they, they never missed a beat. They've got back with their friends. They're doing their thing. Um, you know, wearing the mask is just whatever. It's normal to them. It's all relative. That's all they know because they're really. At least my kids are really young. Um, but you know, during the short stint of time where they had to do the virtual learning, at least in my family, it was an absolute disaster. Disaster, um, a disaster the worst ever. And yeah. I think you know, just talking to friends that that have families, you know, kids of different ages. You know, again, ours are really young. You know, we've got a first grader and then literally like preschool, right? So it's not really a good comparison. But we have lots of friends that have kids that are in junior high or high school, and. I would say that just from those conversations, only the minority of those have felt that their kids have thrived in a virtual setting. The minority, the majority are like, they need to get the hell back, right? Like minority, they're losing like I, their mind. I would say minority to me means 49%. The number of people I've heard who have said their kids are thriving is like, I would say okay. two percent, right? It's fair it's point. Not, fair point. So, and, so give me a, the, give me a different terminology, not not, not the minority. No, so the very like low fr- minority. It's a fringe. <laughs> it's a fringe. It's like a it's a fringe thing. It's yeah. not a mainstream thing at all. And the other thing I I think that's interesting is you think college students will be better, high school kids they they are are struggling just as badly as the elementary school kids are. You know, I have a cousin who's in college um, and she's been fully remote and she's really depressed. And I've heard the same thing about high school kids. I mean, that routine, that getting up, leaving your house, going and being around people, learning in a classroom environment, there's a reason why we've evolved. And that's the norm literally everywhere on the planet. You know, you can go to the most remote rural societies and there's still schools, even if they're in a yurt. You know, that's the way that humans tend to learn. And they've tried lots of things along the way. That one works best. So that's my analogy for why office is going to come back. But I also remember after 9-11, everybody said, nobody's ever going to work in a skyscraper again. Nobody's ever going to work above the 10th floor, the 8th floor, wherever the, the fire escapes can reach or the fire ladders can reach. And you know what? Within a year everybody was working in skyscrapers again. So humans are really bad at terror and fear, (laughs) but they're also really good at amnesia. And so I think that this whole, you know, fear we felt during COVID, as soon as it lifts, it's going to be like it never happened. 
Yeah, no, I love it. I was just having the same conversation about about 9-11 literally this past weekend with a good friend of mine that lived in New York City uh, during 9-11 and uh, worked in a high rise and had lived there for about three years thereafter. And basically he's like, yeah, within a year, year and a half, everything was back to normal. Literally everything was back to normal. It was still a discussion here and there, but yeah, people on airplanes, but like it, there was no trepidation that was a direct result of what had occurred, you know, a year, a year and a half prior. So yeah. yeah so, and that's, easy. that's how I feel. I'm very bullish on America long-term. I'm bullish on real estate. I'm bullish on lots of things. And I think this too shall pass. Yeah. Agreed. Well, Janine, we're going to get personal now and go into what I like to call the lightning round. I'm going to ask Uh-oh. you six questions, uh, looking for six short answers. So first one being your biggest fear, what is it? Oh, drowning. I think drowning. Ugh, sounds yeah. Fine, right. That does. Yeah. That or burning or one of the two, I don't know. One, I don't like know what burning, you're... burning would be quick, right? Drowning. I think uh, you've got like two minutes where you're gasping for air anyway. Okay. Let's change. This. Or, all right. One biggest regret. <laughs> the one biggest regret is probably that I didn't pursue my really moonshot dreams harder. Um, I should just go for broke when you're young and you can take on a lot of risk and try literally your most pie in the sky thing. What was that pie in the sky thing? I always wanted to be an honor broadcast newscaster. All right. Good deal. Well, there's always time. There's time left. There's time left. Yeah, I guess so. Not said yet. How about most influential book? I love memoirs. Um, You know, and I love any writer who's really good at turn of the phrase. So I love Nula Ophelain's books, Mary Carr, uh, Frank McCourt, things like that. Okay. Outside the daily work, Ryan, what do you do to decompress? I like to uh, restore old houses. Wow. Interesting. In uh, in the city or or what? Uh, no, outside the city. Um, I wish I could afford to restore old houses in the city, but a brownstone in New York City will set you back, I don't know, five, 10, 15 million dollars. <laughs> no, I like to buy old uh, old houses that need to be fixed up and restored to their former glory. Okay. How about the one thing that you can't live without? Hmm. I don't know. I hate to be cliche, but probably my children. Yeah, that's good. And then the last question, I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, because you kind of pointed out in the beginning is, you know, what would your backup plan be if one day you woke up and decided you no longer wanted to do what you're doing with Republic, you, know, you wanted to change gears, pivot, what would it be? Uh, I, always, I always wanted to have a cooking show. I think um, like Barefoot Contessa, something like that, where I'm eating and drinking and making party food for all my friends on air. That would be my dream. I love it. You know that YouTube, YouTube, it's all you. You can do it. I know, but I don't even, it turns out I don't even like to cook that much anymore. So it would require <laughs> a wholesale makeover of my whole life. But that is something I've always wanted to do. Maybe, maybe for my second act. Yeah, good deal. Janine, it's been a lot of fun having you here. Thanks for so much for joining us. Very informative, lots of great information. For those that want to learn more about Republic, uh, the real estate platform, and anything else that Republic has to offer, where is the best place to find info? <laughs> Uh, Go to republicreal.com. Republicreal.com. Okay, good deal. I'll put that in the show notes, guys. And Janine, that's all we have. Thanks for joining us here. Thanks. Alrighty, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Buff, wishing you huge success. You take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. We'll see you next Monday morning.